two governor's task forces, Governor Plenty and Governor Dayton. They put a whole bunch of recommendations out. A lot of those recommendations sat in reports that collected dust. Little was done. Uh, so in 2013, actually, we began that conversation in St. Paul. And I made it my personal mission to make sure that Minnesota moved the dial on high-speed internet access in rural Minnesota. And what we've been able to do in the years since is create our border-to-border -border broadband fund, a competitive matching grant fund that leverages uh, some dollars from the state uh, with federal opportunities, local funding, and contributions from providers and cooperatives who are actually doing this work to, expend, to extend their vital information networks around the state for businesses, for farms, for homes. And what we've done in the first three years is extend access to 12,000 homes and businesses uh, with the promise of uh, additional $35 million to extend maybe 20,000 more homes and businesses around the state. And so in my mind, this is the great equalizer for Greater Minnesota. It levels the playing field for our businesses, for our farms, for our families to compete in the 21st century economy. This was an issue that had been talked a lot about, but until I got up to the Senate and made this a, my priority and the Senate's priority, Nothing was done. And so I'm very proud of those efforts. We brought a lot of folks together from around the state to make meaningful change. Thank you. Far. Thank you. Uh, the community problem that I've addressed that I would highlight is my work on the Fairview Hospital Board. I served on the board for about five years, and I was elected chair of the board at a time when the healthcare industry was rapidly changing. The ACA, or the Accountable Care Act, was being discussed in Washington and healthcare institutions all over the country did not have a clear idea of where the path was gonna be headed, how reimbursement models were gonna change, and how the federal government was gonna fundamentally turn one-sixth of our economy upside down with new regulations and laws. So as the chair of a small community health system here in Red Wing, my fundamental focus was how to preserve quality care close to home. And little is known about that two-year negotiation process that we went through. I led the board through a strategic planning process Again, to try to discern, as a small player in a very large and complex industry, how are we going to preserve care for the community of Red Wing? As I said, the industry was consolidating, and players in the metro in southeastern Minnesota and up by Duluth and western part of the state were all trying to create partnerships so that they could have the biggest benefit out of the Accountable Care Act. Um, you know the outcome of that um, strategic planning process. We entered into the negotiation um, with Mayo. And I'm very proud of that because it did preserve what we set out to do, quality care close to home. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Soon after I uh, was on the, first came on the Red Wing City Council, um, the owner or the operator of the Mississippi National Golf Links, which is a city-owned uh, municipal golf course, 36-hole municipal golf course, announced that he was leaving and he would no longer be operating that course. Um, as many of you in the room here know, the course uh, employs uh, quite a few people, I think 13 at this point, uh, and it's enjoyed by people all over southeastern Minnesota, and it's certainly an asset that the city wanted to maintain. So we had to decide what to do, and it was, uh, we went, I, I was on the, uh, the committee at the, when I was on the council at the time, that worked hard on trying to figure out what to do next with the least cost to the city while maintaining this beautiful asset and trying to figure out how to move forward. Uh, we found out that we had a lot of limits. We couldn't just turn it over to be developed. There are, are, there are um, uh, easements on it and reasons why we couldn't develop it. And of course, many of us didn't want to develop it. Uh, there were a lot of very vigorous, very vehement, differing opinions on what the city should do. Uh, we had numerous, uh, very heated public uh, meetings, public hearings, public debates. I stood on the stage of the, Red, the Sheldon Theater and was uh, vigorously shouted at about what we should do. But over time, what we did was we worked with a local community group which stepped forward as volunteers and said they wanted to work with the city cooperatively. Uh, I was on the negotiating committee of numerous, many uh, detailed uh, negotiations to figure out how the city was going to help and then how the city would slowly withdraw from supporting that. And that's what we've done. We've had a five-year commitment with them. Uh, we're slowly every year withdrawing the amount of money that the city spends. Uh, we're now in, we have two years left of that. And it's been a successful project. I don't know how long it's going to continue going, but it's been a, a great example of a public-private partnership I'm very proud of. Thank you. Our next question, we will start with Dana. A recent report stated that large areas of the state's water resources are no longer safe for swimming or fishing. If elected, what efforts would you support to improve this situation? 
Sure. Well, thank you for the question. This is an important one, and, and the governor has, I think, called uh, the year ahead the year of action on water quality in Minnesota. I think if you look at Minnesota in the land of 10,000 lakes, this is not a challenge that we should take lightly. Uh, this is a, a shared value for, for all Minnesotans. And so the challenge for us is how we improve water quality. Uh, it, it's easy to set goals and to, uh, you know, to have uh, uh, aspirations, but you've got to have a stakeholder process where you bring not only legislators together from both sides of the aisle and both bodies, but also stakeholders from around the state. Uh, folks who live by Lake Pepin, for instance, and are fearful of its sedimentation and it filling in with sand. Uh, also those who live in rural Minnesota who want to be able to swim in their lakes uh, in waterways. But also, very importantly, uh, those who are in agriculture and, and farm owners. And so I think it's important for us, uh, whether it's in the, the Agriculture Committee on which I serve, or the Energy and Environment Committee on which I serve, or the Legislative Water Commission on which I serve, to have that thorough vetting process and that stakeholder engagement that makes meaningful change possible. And so I think that's the template that I would follow for promoting water quality. But when you look at public policy and at the state legislator, legislature or at our local level, <laughs> Windows of opportunity for action open up every once in a while. And I think we do have a window of opportunity for in improving water quality in the years ahead. But it's not necessarily what we do, it's how we get there. We need to extend, I think, an invitation to all stakeholders to join the conversation, to have buy-in at all levels of this conversation so that we're able to make sustained change and improved water quality. And so it's not just the what, it's the how, and that's a process that I would take very seriously and follow, as I have for the last few years. Thank you. Bye. Can you repeat the question and the, the um, study that you were, somebody was quoting? Certainly. A recent report stated that large areas of the state's water resources are no longer safe for swimming or fishing. If elected, what efforts would you support to improve this situation? Okay. Um, I, the reason I ask that is because I saw a counter study to, I think, the one that's being mentioned there that um, questioned uh, how that was done and really are there large, you know, quantity, volumes of water that aren't safe. Um, I think in most places we have safe drinking water. Um, we have done a lot to work on um, runoff water um, and the buffer law that was passed and revised in the legislature last year um, uh, did some things to address runoff water. But we also, I think, need to watch for some overreaching government regulation. I've talked to a lot of farmers and farming is a very important our economy, um, and there were some issues with that buffer law that needed to be um, revised. Right now, the DNR puts out maps, and the farmer has to look at a map of their property, and the DNR is able to stipulate uh, where they need to have a buffer zone. And I've talked to farmers who have said if there's a particular heavy rainfall, a puddle could form on their land, and then that would be declared an area where they need to have plants, you know, or that could be an area where the DNR would say that's not safe drinking water. So I think we need to be very accurate when we make these claims about, about water. Um, and it's also um, something that we just, we need to call out and work together on and involve all the stakeholders, whether it's citizens or farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Well, water quality obviously is an issue that we in Red Wing uh, and all up and down the Mississippi are very concerned about. It's something we hear about on city council constantly, uh, but it's also something we spend a lot of money working on. Uh, I really agree with Matt on this, and, and I think with what, what Barb was saying as well. What we need to do in this area, people don't, everyone agrees we need clean water. The question is, uh, who's going to pay for it if we're, going to, if we're going to clean it up, and how are we going to do that? Um, what we've seen at the city level is a number of unfunded mandates, I think, that are <coughs> issued, so are directives that have come down from the state that have cost our city huge amounts of money. Uh, we've really been in a position of trying to figure out how to pay for them, what to do, uh, and really questioning some of them. Uh, and, and I think that's okay. It's okay for the cities and the municipalities to be questioning, to be active members of all of these um, uh, directives. I think we've got to consult with the farmers, we've got to consult with the local business owners and with the um, with the municipalities about how are you going to enforce this, who's going to pay for it, and not just, the state just can't be pushing down the cost onto the local governments because that, that is not a good, unless you have buy-in, unless you have everyone agreeing on what's going to happen, it's not going to be enforceable and it's not going to happen. Thank you. Well, I agree with all the uh, candidates up here on the clean water. I mean, that's, that's our lifeline out here. We, are, we all need clean water. Um, Again, with the water runoff, the buffer laws, uh, 
The farmers, again, they're, like Barb said, they're concerned with what the DNR is doing. Those maps that the farmers have to go by are constantly changing on them. It's a moving target. Uh, they never know month to month what's going to happen and what's going to be uh, required of them from the DNR. So we need to look at that. We need to get that straightened out. Um, the other thing is we also, like they said, involve all the stakeholders. We need to get residents, businesses, farmers, uh, experts in the, in the field all together and come up with some what, we, what I would call the smart uh, actions. They got to be a specific, they got to be measurable, they got to be achievable, they have to be realistic, and they have to be timely. So we need to make sure that that's what we're doing when we when we look at these unfunded mandates from the state that you know just keep being forced down on the, on the cities all the time. As Lisa said, we we get those all the time, and our towns like us, we're struggling to make that happen. You know, our property taxes are going up cr like, like crazy right now. Mine personally went up 22.6 percent this year, so. Uh, we need to get get the unfunded mandates from the state under control in order to really address this issue. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question uh, we will begin with uh, is pre kindergarten to grade 12 education appropriately supported by the state? That's a great question. Um, it's an interesting fact that education funding in Minnesota has never decreased. And that tells me that that's a value that we all share regardless of party affiliation, right? I know I was raised by two teachers who taught me that your biggest job as a kid was to go to school and get a good ed education because everything in your life followed from it, right? And I tried to teach my kids that. Um, so the, the issue of education pre-K through 12, um, there's always um, more to be done, right? And that's a good challenge for all of us, whether we're educators or we're parents or we're citizens, we constantly need to be looking for improvement. Um, this year, the House Republicans passed um, the highest increase ever, $525 million in education. Uh, that funded a new preschool pilot program um, for communities where um, uh, kids living at a certain um, income level that don't have access to preschool can get into a preschool program. Um, funded all kinds of things up through um, college and career readiness programs. So it, it is very important. But money doesn't solve all the problems in education. I think it's incumbent on us as community members to get involved. Uh, I happen to be the first executive director of Every Can Joined, and that was an effort to bring the community in, and to partner with the educators and work on student outcomes. So it's, it's innovation and creativity and a willingness to commit to the process um, that will also make our education system better. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Catherine. Well, I think the answer to the question uh, is no. I think that there is more that the state could be doing uh, in the area of education, and, and there's more both funding-wise and also, uh, as Barb was mentioning, other things. Um, first of all, I think we should be uh, quality pre-K or pre-kindergarten uh, program should be available, not necessarily required, but available to all. Uh, now that's something we're not even close to yet, but it's something we should continue working on. The pilot program that Barb mentioned is great, but Red Wing, for example, applied for it and was denied. So that was 110 kids who didn't get to go to that program this year who, who would otherwise under the programs that, were, um, that could have been funded. Uh, in addition, I think um, but there's more we could be doing on reducing the size of um, the classroom size, uh, and, and there's more that the state could be doing. Although they have gotten, we have gotten better uh, on helping with infrastructure, school infrastructure, so that our school boards aren't continually coming back uh, to the local schools and local people and asking for more in terms of referendums. I think we could be doing more in that area. Um, I think every hand joined, uh, and I'm on the partner table of that and a very proud member of that. I think it's a wonderful program. It's a great example of, a, again, a public-private uh, initiative where we're getting together people from all over the community to increase outcomes, in this case, for Red Wing students. The state has been supportive of Every Hand Join and of a few other programs like it around the state. They're really creative. They're really working on new and exciting ways to increase outcomes. I think the state could be doing more in that area. We've got to make sure that um, that we've got good outcomes, that we're looking and measuring exactly what these programs are doing. But when they are successful, we should be supporting them, and I think we could do more of that. Thank you. Hi. Oh, well, we all want to have good education for our students. Um, that's a given. I was raised in a family that 
mom and dad always said, you can never go wrong with investing in education. Nobody can ever take that away from you. Uh, and I took advantage of that. I have two degrees. I have a business degree from Gustavus, and I have one from electrical engineering degree from University of Colorado at Denver. So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in good education. Uh, my sons, when, when they were in preschool age, we had them at a, at a private preschool uh, in Colorado. Very good program. I think we need to look at having those type of programs in, in the smaller communities like ourselves. And um, as, as everybody has said, with every hand joined, that's a wonderful program. Uh, it helps the kids understand what they need, you know, what their talents are, what, and encourage them to uh, pursue their talents and their dreams. Uh, right now, that, that's the big thing. I mean, uh, you know, you look around, and, and we need these kids coming up well-educated, and we need to do all we can to support that because as a project manager at the nuclear power plant, I see our workforce getting older. I don't see a lot of younger folks coming into the trades. And as a union member, we definitely need more people in the trades that are qualified to do the work that's going to be required of us in the future if we're going to have any kind of infrastructure going forward. So uh, we definitely need to support all that. This is an, an incredibly important question, so I hope we revisit education here tonight. Um, you just look at what we've done in the last four years on education. We repaid a billion dollar school funding shift uh, to, balance, to, to fund our schools honestly, uh, and also we invested an additional billion dollars on top of that. Uh, about 60% of those new funds were on the funding formula, but 40% targeted new ways for funding schools, in some cases that disproportionately benefited our rural districts. Facility funding, equity aid, and also a bill that I carried successfully, uh, expanding rural education partnerships, like Every Hand Joined. I really think there's a great value in having uh, local solutions in which the state partners, but allows the local approach to prosper. I think there's great value in that, and that's what we're trying to promote uh, with, with our, our rural education partnerships. And so I think flexibility for our rural schools is just as important as the resources that we deliver to them. And I think when it comes to early childhood education, I mean, the, the data is, is pretty straightforward. It's one of the, the most important things that we can invest in as a state right there with broadband, actually, in terms of the return on investment. Uh, and we know that there's a great inequalities from property tax wealthy school districts to those school districts that don't have the same resources. So at the state level, we want to try to even out the playing field a little bit to allow our rural districts every chance to educate their children you know, as uh, our, rural, or our, our wealthy suburban districts might. And so I think that, that focus on adequate resources, flexibility, and promoting the kind of partnership like every hand joined, that's where that sweet spot is on, on early education. And I think we're moving in the right direction as a state. Thank you. With our next question, we will begin with Lisa. What is your position on photo IDs for Minnesota voters? For, that's the whole question? For all Minnesota voters? For Minnesota voters. Photo ID. For voters. OK. Um, well, as a former member, I'm not a member now, but as a former member of the League of Women Voters, I, I certainly um, uh, believe that the right to vote fairly and uh, the right for everyone to vote regardless of party uh, is something that we've got to hold dear and it's something we've got to protect and uh, requiring uh, everyone to have a photo ID I think is something that would potentially disenfranchise uh, a, a group of people that that shouldn't be disenfranchised and I'm talking about uh, people who are uh, uh, poor, people who are not drivers, people who are potentially elderly or have never had uh, identification like that. Uh, I think the, uh, while some people will say that there has been voter fraud or some, something like that, uh, none of the studies bear that out. There is a remarkably low incidence of anything like that in our country, and I think we should be really proud of that. I think we have fantastic uh, voter uh, election judges who do a really good job of making sure that, um, that that doesn't happen. And when it does, of course, it should be prosecuted to the full extent, but I, I think that, that studies show it hasn't happened. Uh, so I think that Ultimately, that that is uh, not something that would I would support. Um, I think it's it's not necessary, and it's something that would drive out and not allow certain groups of people to vote. Thank you. Well, we need to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the voting process. Uh, we have to make sure that we don't have fraud in there. Uh, I do support having voter ID. Uh, we have many mechanisms in place to make sure that people can get voter IDs. And uh, we have uh, people that will take people down to the uh, 
driver's license office, get their photo ID. You can bring in a, a water bill, utility bill, a phone bill showing your address. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have that because we need to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the voting law. And without that, we run the risk of having, having widespread voter fraud. And we've seen that in other areas of the country with that. And we need to make sure that we, we don't have that. And it's not that big of an inconvenience for people to get, an, get a photo ID. And we have plenty of people that are willing to help out to make sure that these individuals can go get the ID necessary uh, so that they can vote. Thank you. Right. This is an, another important question, because we've seen some states take really significant steps in, in uh, introducing barriers to voting. Now, as a proud Minnesotan, uh, we all know that uh, Minnesota votes probably uh, in, in greater uh, percentages than any other state in the country. Uh, so we have a rich tradition of voter participation. And when you look at the state of our politics now, especially in Washington, you know, I think uh, a lot of folks are turned off by negative campaigning or just the partisanship they see out in Washington. We want to make it easier for folks to, to, to take part in the democratic process, to encourage voting honest voting. And we don't want to introduce barriers that are arbitrary. And I have to tell you, you look, you look across the, the, the river right here in Wisconsin, and uh, there's a lot of compare and contrast that we could offer about how Minnesota's doing it right and Wisconsin isn't. I think this is an important one. Uh, they introduced a, a very burdensome voter ID law, and the courts overturned it. Uh, and I have to tell you, folks, we should follow the data on this issue. There's no data suggesting that there's widespread voter fraud. But what we know is that some states are pursuing uh, laws to hinder voting uh, of, of certain portions of the population. And I don't think that's good for democracy. I think one thing that we want to be able to rely upon is our vote counts, and that when we go to the polls, we can expect to be heard. And so uh, I, I would be opposed to voter ID. Thank you. Oh, Barb. I would be in support of uh, photo ID for voting. Uh, voting is, a, is our most sacred you know, right and privilege as a member of the United States of America. Um, I've been a voting judge myself. Uh, I've talked to voting judges. I actually was in uh, Cannon Falls uh, doing some campaigning and talked to a husband and wife couple who were going up to be voting judges um, in the primary election. And they were recounting stories of, of voter fraud. Um, so it, it, it is real. Uh, I won't, don't want to over exaggerate the issue, but I don't see the harm in having an identification process. Um, you have to give an ID to cash a check very often. You have to give an ID to get a, get a beer at a restaurant. Um, you have to have a, a student ID. In, in our culture, identification is used for many, many, many things. And I think we can get around um, the issue of, of folks that may not drive or, or may not um, have other you know, means to have an ID. That is a solvable problem. We can do that in a, in a just and respectful and right way. But it's, it is incumbent on our democracy to make sure that our election process is free of fraud and that when people walk into that election booth, it's with enormous pride to keep this country as strong as it is. And I think what all Thank you. Now, the next question we will begin with Mike. What is your stand on the gas tax? My stand on the gas tax, or the one that the Democrats tried to push through, which was about a 16 cent per gallon tax increase, uh, with, an, with an additional 6.5% on the wholesale price of the gas, um, that one is unconscionable. I mean, we, we've got hard working families out here trying to make a living, trying to get to work, and now we're going to try to make it even more difficult for people to get to, to get the gas in their tanks so that they can get to their job. Uh, that's not, that, that just can't happen. We have plenty of money coming in from our current gas tax that we have. The other thing that we're not doing and that we should be doing is looking at taking money out of the general funds like most every other state in the nation does to fund our transportation needs. Uh, and we have to take that and use it towards roads and bridges and keep our infrastructure that keeps our economy moving in good working condition so people can arrive to work and get home from work safely. Um, Having that type of tax on, on the gas is just, that's crippling to our economy. And businesses can't afford it, farmers can't afford it, and most importantly, the, the poor families out there that are trying to get their, their work and earn their pay, they can't afford that as well. 
So we need to look at taking additional funds out of the general fund and using that towards our roads and bridges. Thank you. Matt? So this is an important issue as well. I look at 2017, if there's two things that we do, and we do them well, one is healthcare uh, access and affordability. The second is transportation funding. Uh, experts tell us that we underfund our roads and bridges by as much as $800 million a year, annually. So Minnesota has a budget surplus. We could solve that problem for one year. What about year two, three, four, and for the next 30? We've got to figure out a comprehensive way of funding transportation around the state. And so for the last couple of years, two years in fact, I've worked with Representative Kelly and, uh, and a group from uh, the Senate and the House, 10 members on our Transportation Conference Committee. And we looked at a number of different ways of trying to, to shrink that gap, that 800 million annual transportation funding deficit. Uh, there's a few ways that we can look uh, at, at solving this. We can look at the general fund, but I have to tell you, if you listen to this forum tonight, in all the ideas for investing uh, in education or healthcare or others, that general fund can only do so much. And history has taught us that when the legislature goes to the general fund for transportation funding, the next budget deficit or, or financial squeeze eliminates that new funding in transportation. And so what we thought might have been an ongoing commitment to, to new funding for roads and bridges becomes a temporary uh, infusion of dollars for roads and bridges. We need constitutionally dedicated resources for our roads and bridges. The gas tax is like any other tax. You know, we don't like to pay those taxes. But it's constitutionally dedicated for roads and bridges. Our state constitution tells us to do two things. Fund our schools adequately and maintain our roads and bridges. The gas tax is constitutionally dedicated to do just that. And so I, I think that it's important for us to recognize that there's no perfect tool, but this is a pretty good one. And we've got to be willing to be pragmatic about solving these sorts of problems. bill that Tim Kelly and the Transportation Committee had spent two years working on uh, had a six to eight billion dollar ten year comprehensive plan to fund our road and bridges and it did not include a gas tax. Particularly in a year when we had such a large budget surplus, um, there was money there to be applied to the transportation bill as well as taking bonding dollars. But another piece of this I think we need to call out. I, I looked at that gas tax and to me it was a very recessive tax. It would hurt the poor people of our state more than the wealthy. Uh, the percentage of, of you know, dollars that they use to, in transportation to get to jobs, to get to their kids to school, adding more tax on that would be extremely burdensome. It also would create undue burden to our small businesses. It's important to recognize that the state of Minnesota is in the top 10 category in all tax brackets. You don't want to be in the top 10 in taxes, and we are. And it, it fundamentally hurts our competitiveness, it hurts our industry, it hurts our ability to, to attract workers and to maintain a vibrant economy. So adding another tax isn't the right thing to do. I would not be in favor. Thank you. Lisa. Well, I think one of the things that was accomplished through all of the discussion over the last two years was a recognition on both sides that we have this funding gap. We've got to come up with some way to answer this that isn't just a one-time solution. This is going to be an ongoing issue. As I under, I, I've heard, six to eight hundred dollars annually. Uh, it's just not something that's going to go away or that can be solved. I don't believe by by going back to the general fund. And I think the minute we start going back to the general fund for things like transportation, education is the first thing that loses out. Um, so I, I think that we've already come to an understanding of what the need is. Now we need to come together and figure out how we're going to fix that. The gas tax is one way to get there. I think there are other ways that we could uh, we could address that problem. I think the committee that came together, and I, I would be supportive of uh, working, continuing to work across the aisle and coming up with creative ways to do that, uh, can come up with some ways to, to fund that. Uh, but it should be something that's dedicated, a dedicated source of revenue, uh, whether that's a creative mix of uh, fees or other ways to create that money. But the money has to come from somewhere, everybody. And, uh, and so we've got to figure out a way to do that. I believe that having the users, the people who are actually on the road, using the roads, uh, impacting the quality of the roads are the ones that probably are going to have to help uh, pony up for that. So is it something we want to do? No. Uh, but it's something we need to do, and we need to do it now. Oh, you asked me a doozy there. 
Well, folks, uh, you know, this is an issue that I, I take very seriously. And as I had mentioned earlier, it was not talked about at the legislature. Uh, a lot of time had been spent uh, with really impressive task forces, and, and Governor Pawlenty and Governor Dayton were interested in the topic, but the legislature just really didn't act. And so in, in 2013, we, uh, we started the conversation. And I have to tell you, there's probably no single issue where we've made more traction as a state uh, in the last few years than broadband access. Uh, we had mentioned already connecting 12,000 homes and businesses with high-speed internet. Uh, also, over 100 community anchor institutions, like schools or libraries or hospitals. Places and people and institutions that lacked access now have it because of this effort. And so this year, in a year in which a lot of us are frustrated with not getting more done, Broadband was the single biggest accomplishment on a, on a bipartisan basis. Republicans, Democrats in the House and the Senate and the governor all supported doing more on broadband. And folks, I, you know, uh, that's a conversation that started in the last three years since I've been up there. And it's one I want to continue. And I think there's great strides that we have made and there's a lot that we can do to, to further extend the, the benefits of high-speed internet access. It's the rural electrification issue of the, the 21st century. And I look forward to continuing the momentum that we've, we've uh, garnered in, in, in broadband access and building from that. And so uh, I appreciate the question. And uh, if you know me, this is an issue I can talk a lot about. And uh, I'll stop there. I just look forward to, to translating this energy and this uh, passion I have for broadband into, into some other issues as well in 2017. And as I mentioned previously, healthcare is going to be uh, the issue that I am going to uh, focus on more than any other in, in 2017. So thank you. I would have liked to know what the issue specifically that the, uh, the person who wrote the question wanted to address, but um, we'll just take a, a broader brush, I guess. Um, Matt's done a lot of work in this area. Uh, a couple things just to point out. There are two funding sources for broadband. It's the state level, and there's also significant funding at the federal level. And one of the things we need to watch for is wasteful spending at the state. In the past, there's been funding available at the federal level that we have let sit behind because we doubled up at the state. And that is something that is something we don't need to repeat. So we want to make sure we're using federal grants when they're available um, and not, uh, not doubling up our resources. Another thing to point out is there are multiple ways to get access. Um, High-speed access can be achieved, achieved through wireless, for example, right? We're all using our wireless phones everywhere. So it's not necessary all the time that it has to be um, broadband. So broadband can encompass a lot of things. It's kind of a buzzword now when you hear broadband, that's all good. And it is good to have access. But I would like to point out that there's multiple ways to um, achieve that. Thank you. Lisa. Well, this is something that uh, the city of Red Wing has been very fortunate uh, in this regard because um, years ago, about eight years ago, we had task forces looking at this. How are we going to get broadband or high-speed internet into Red Wing? We saw it as something we really needed in order to be competitive uh, and, and do economic development. And uh, we, real, the city even toyed with, should we actually get into the business of doing this? And we really didn't want to do that. That didn't seem appropriate. Uh, and right at that time, HBC, uh, Hiawatha uh, Broadband, the company, uh, decided out of Winona, decided to expand into Red Wing. And that was an amazing thing. So we were almost like a test case for uh, what could happen when a private business then came in and provided this uh, wonderful resource. And we've seen the benefits already in Red Wing. Uh, if people here know about Red Wing Ignite, a uh, local sort of incubator that works on uh, trying to um, promote and uh, uh, provide access to high technology businesses to startups here in Red Wing. We've only been able to do that and provide that because of this access to high speed uh, uh, internet. And so I, I would certainly support it. I think that any, if the state can provide support, that's something we could look at. But I also think uh, where we can allow and encourage private businesses to get into that, uh, we should be doing that as well because we've seen how, how well that can benefit the community here. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, we definitely need to have the rural broadband or, in this case, you know, just access to technology, uh, communications technologies, uh, whether that be the wireless, as Barb said, or fiber, like uh, Lisa said, or uh, with the broadband that uh, Matt's been talking about. Uh, we need to make sure that these rural communities like ourselves have that access so that our fire, our rescue, our schools, our hospitals, uh, our businesses, our farmers can, can run their businesses, run their organizations, and, and keep up with the technology that's out there and keep up with the metro communities. Uh, education uses it. It's a huge asset for our, our schools right now. Uh, and our kids are, are 
learning immensely from, from having that access to it. Um, I agree with Barb that you know we need to make sure we don't waste our, our state money. We need to look at grants available from the federal government. Uh, that is still taxpayer money, but we don't need to be doubling down and doubling efforts down on the same thing when we can be spreading that money out over other, other sources and other needs. So we do need to have the rural broadband or the rural uh, communications high-speed access. And uh, I do support working with uh, various organizations and entity to, entities to uh, uh, get, that, get that going, keep it going, and attract businesses to our community. Thank you. The next question, we will begin with Barb. This is a three-part question. Do you believe climate change is real? If so, what efforts at the state level would you support to reduce carbon dioxide levels? If not, why not? And I have to start with that one? Yes, you do. <laughs> Our climate's changing all the time, so that I, I, I think that's something that we're all aware of. Um, we've had a pretty rainy spring and summer, haven't we? I know I watch the river all the time, and it's going up 12 inches one day, and it's going you know down 18 in the, the next day. Um, efforts at the state level to address it, to address that. I would need to do more research on that. Most of the things that um, I guess I'm familiar with are federal issues and even international issues. Frankly, that's where we've seen the the, um, the impact um, because the climate isn't just in one place. Um, so I would have to do some more study on that, so I'm not going to uh, try to work my way through that. And the third question was, the third part of the question? Um, you guys if, not, if, why not. if not, why not? <laughs> I guess it's, uh, the question okay. was, do you believe climate change is real? If so, what efforts at the state level would you support to reduce carbon dioxide levels? And if you do not believe it is real, why not? I guess I think I answered it. Thank you. I thought so, too. <laughs> Lisa. Well, I, I think, yes, I think man-made climate change is an absolute fact. I think uh, it's something that we need to address. Now, the extent of it, the scope of it, we can all debate, but I certainly think, think that the world is a very different place than it was uh, even just 100 years ago, and I think that's in large, uh, in large part due to our man-made, uh, our, our efforts and things that we've done. Now, uh, we can't just close our lives down. We've got to keep operating. We've got to keep businesses going. We've got to keep our economies going. Uh, and so we've got to figure out how, what are we going to do here? How are we going to go forward uh, in a way that doesn't impact our economy ne negatively and yet recognizes that uh, we do have some responsibility for change here? In Red Wing, we've looked at this uh, since I've been on the council. We started a sustainability commission, which is a group of citizens, um, volunteers who are made up just to look at ways that the city and citizens, but the city itself, can uh, reduce its impact on the climate and that anything that we do is, quote, sustainable, meaning that it's not going to impact uh, the economy over time. So we're looking at things like um, uh, making sure that our fleet, our, our the city-owned fleet is uh, economic or uh, environmentally sustainable. Uh, making sure that all of our uh, things like um, water runoff or things like any kind of uh, impact on uh, energy use that the city does, that we're doing it in the least uh, environmentally damaging way possible. And because of the studies and the recommendations of the Sustainability Commission, we've changed our practices. There have been several things that we've done differently. Uh, we've actually installed solar panels. So you can see them right next door here. And uh, because of that, we've saved taxpayers money and we've reduced the impact on, this, on the um, environment and that's something I would support at the state level as well thank you Mike yes there is climate change going on we all know that it changes every single day uh, there's data out there that, that supports that the climate has been changing it's been changing for millions of years um, how we would ad address the co2 reduction at the state level we need to make sure that we keep our nuclear power plants in this state operating right now <laughs> nuclear power is not giving any chance to survive in these, this state if we continue down the road that we go where we give subsidies to all the renewable energies, which I'm not against. I'm not against uh, solar. I'm not against wind. What I am against is the fact that we totally subsidize those so much that we've lost sight of having a good energy policy. And good energy policy has a good energy mix. With nuclear power, we have the least 
uh, CO2 output of any energy supply out there. So we need to make sure that we keep these, operate, these plants operating and we keep them going uh, because they supply readily available electricity 24-7, 365. The only time they don't is when we take them down for a shutdown for refueling. And the other nice thing about it is with new nuclear technology, we're going to have, we have the potential to take our used fuel rods off our pad and repurpose them into new small modular reactors, breeder reactors, and molten salt reactors. So we have the potential to get rid of an issue that we've all dealt with here for a long time that people are real passionate about, and that opportunity needs to be taken advantage of. Thank you. Matt. You know, I, I agree that this uh, discussion on, uh, on addressing climate change, which is real and is something that we need to take very seriously and act upon, uh, often skirts past, I think, a, a great resource we have not far from here, and that is nuclear energy. And I think it's incumbent upon our state legislature and uh, in the state of Minnesota and the federal government to look to a long-term solution for spent nuclear fuel. Because until we tackle that challenge, uh, the, the future of nuclear energy in, in Minnesota and the country is up in the air. And so for the last um, four years, I've actually served on uh, a panel of, of state, state legislators from around the country uh, looking for that long-term energy policy for spent nuclear fuel. It's the National Conference of State Legislators Nuclear Energy Work Group, and uh, we, uh, we work on this issue. And we're looking at uh, alternatives to Yucca Mountain, uh, ways that we're able to make Prairie Island sustainable over the long term. You know, when you talk about combating global climate change, a lot of terms that are utilized are diversifying our energy portfolio. Well, what does that mean? I think that does mean promoting renewables that make sense, that are sustainable, that are economical, and that have broad community buy-in. And I think that's an area where we can continue to do some work in Minnesota, that broad community buy-in, economic renewables, uh, approaches that work with a proven track record. You know, one thing that we've spent some time in Minnesota on the last couple of years is, is trying to develop markets and, and uh, manufacturers. And our Made in Minnesota solar uh, uh, program has been very successful. If you look around southeastern Minnesota, we have a number of uh, uh, firms that are playing in this arena that are, are benefiting from a focus on renewables. But I think if I could reiterate, the point that's lost too often in this conversation is how important nuclear energy is to the future of combating global to climate change. And that's something that we can't take our eye off, especially here in Red Wing. Thank you. Our next question, we will begin with Lisa. What is your position on Sunday liquor sales? <laughs> Personally or professionally? <laughs> professionally. No. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, well, I will say uh, that personally, it's not something I've really felt strongly about. I, I've sort of thought, gee, what's the problem? You know, I don't, I don't uh, personally see a, a problem with it. Uh, but I've talked to some of the local business owners and local liquor store owners, and they've told me in no uncertain terms that they're against it. Uh, so it, it's something I would certainly want to listen to um, uh, our local people and, and see if there's something that, uh, you know, if there's something we can do in that area, if there's something they could live with. If not, uh, I would want to listen to our local business owners and, and go with what they say. Thank you. Mike. Well, it's uh, pre-planning. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> think about it. <laughs> If you want to buy a six pack and you know you're going to have it for you want to have it for the Sunday football game, why not buy it on Saturday or Friday? Um, I'm, I'm a, again with Lisa. I, I talked to local uh, liquor store owners and they said the same thing. So then I went across the river and said, "Well, what do you think?" And they said, "Stay shut down on Sundays because we love the business." So it's a give or take on, you know, when you're a border community like we are. Um, but again, like Lisa said, we need to, you know, listen to the to the residents, listen to the business owners. Uh, you know, it's a big thing up in the metro areas because they've got the big box retailers up there that uh, you know they can be open like that. Uh, it does put an impact on our, our local business owners to have that additional cost of being open on Sundays. Um, and quite honestly, like I said at the beginning, I just pre-plan it. Uh, if you want to buy a six-pack or whatever you want, a bottle of wine or whatever it is, you know. Buy, you know, buy it sooner rather than later, so. <laughs> Thank you. Matt? Uh, you know, we, we laugh at this issue, and I have to tell you, having, uh, having been in office for, for four years now, uh, we get a lot of inquiries from uh, constituents who, for them, this is the number one issue. And so, uh, <laughs> and believe it or not, this is true. And so, um, you know, you, you grow up in Red Wing on a border town like this. You see folks going over to Wisconsin for fireworks and, and, and maybe to, uh, to make those Friday uh, or Saturday runs. 
You know, I think it's, it's important for us to look at the fact that the, the, the voting on this has changed and, and the margin by which uh, the Sunday liquor sales uh, bill has failed is shrinking over time. And so I think it's probably inevitable that there will be Sunday sales uh, in Minnesota in the years to come. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's just a reality that we're probably going to be, you know, welcoming if that's the position we hold or, or fearful of if, if, if that's the case. But, I, you know, I've supported it in the past, and I think it is going to be something that's going to change in law. And so uh, whether it's this coming legislature or, or, or down the road a few years from now, but it's, it's very likely to happen just based upon the, uh, the growing support for it. Thank you. Barb. I think there are more important issues that our state needs to address, and <laughs> we've talked about it enough. Um, I would agree with what everybody said here. The local um, business owners that I've talked to don't want it, and so we can move on. Thank you. The next question, we will begin with Mike. How would you support local issues if it might be different from your party's platform? Well, when I uh, interviewed or went up and talked to the Republican Senate uh, leaders, I told them, I said, you're not getting a rubber stamp up here. Um, I said, the people of the Senate District 21 own that seat. It's their seat. It's nobody else's seat. Uh, it'd be my privilege to sit in that seat and be the voice for the people of Senate District 21. And I will do what's in the best interest of Senate District 21 first and foremost. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of people that are going to put a lot of pressure on you up there. Uh, I'm sure Matt's experienced that himself. Uh, but rural communities are a lot different than metro communities. And we need to make sure that our voices are heard up there and that we have strong representation that will not back down to the metro interests up there to support a Southwest Light Rail train over our road and bridge bonding bill that had money in there for Highway 61 development, had money in there for the Sturgeon Lake Road overpass on the railroad tracks, that both the casino, the nuclear plant, and the lock and dam need. And those are things that we need to make sure we have a senator up there that's going to be strong to stand up to that leadership and say, no, I'm standing for my people in my district. This is what they want. This is what they've asked for. That's going to be my stance. Thank you. Matt. So I'll answer the question uh, very briefly and then respond to, to that attack, if you will. But first of all, I think that uh, there's no pressure on us to do uh, uh, what the party tells us to do, or at least I don't feel it. I go up to St. Paul, and my number one goal every day is to represent this area. Uh, that's what I ran on. That's what I've done for four years. That's what I'll continue to do. Uh, and I have never felt that I could put, that I had to put uh, those principles on the back seat to party politics. And so every vote I've taken, I've taken because I think it's the right thing to do. And I'll continue to do that. And we talked a lot about broadband today, folks. I'm going to tell you, that was not a priority for my leadership. It became a priority because we talked about it and we built a coalition and we talked about the benefits of putting that on our agenda. It's not something my leadership wanted to do, but we did it because we worked through our differences. And there's a whole host of issues that you don't read about in the paper or you don't know about that we work with our leadership and with our colleagues on to maybe moderate our approach. Uh, and that happens in the committee process. That happens when we're caucusing with our, our colleagues. That happens on the Senate floor when we're taking votes. And so there's a whole list of examples of how we stand up for our district uh, over the face of, of perceived pressures from our party. And so I want to I spend some time on this, on this light rail issue because I think that's important for folks to realize. You know, more and more Minnesotans are moving to the metropolitan area and they have more and more legislators. If we're ever going to have a comprehensive transportation package in Minnesota, we're going to have to recognize that the priorities that we share as rural Minnesotans for roads and bridges are not always the priorities that are shared by our metropolitan peers. They want a solution for transit. And so we can sit here and we can demagogue, you know, taking the right stand and, and having a statewide approach to comprehensive transportation funding. But we also have to recognize, to be pragmatic, we have to listen to what others are saying. And that means we have to be willing to, to go down that road of transit funding. Thank you. Barb. I've spent a lot of time talking to people at their doors and at coffee shops and in their homes the past nine months. And maybe the number, the one thing that I hear from voters is how frustrated they are with partisan politics. They want government to work for them or government to get out of their way so they can work. That's the bottom line. elected your representative. It's my voice to represent you. And that's the fundamental purpose of why you would elect me. And that, that needs to always stay in the forefront. Um, 
most issues are, are complicated, right? And they're complex. And it requires somebody that has the ability to dig deep and become an expert on the issue and understand the both sides of the story, right? And somebody who is able to work across the aisle and understand that compromise is not a bad thing. Compromise is how we get things done. And that's what I've heard from the voters. Please go to St. Paul and get something done for us. And that would be my goal. Thank you. Lisa. Well, I agree with Barb. The number one thing after health care that I hear about is people saying at the doors, just go up and get it done. Just, just work and get something accomplished here. It doesn't have to be perfect. We understand that there's going to be need for compromise. But I started out tonight by saying that I wanted to go to St. Paul to be a strong advocate for this area, and I believe that very, very strongly. What we need is people to go to St. Paul who can say, here are the needs of this district that are going to be different from the needs of the metro area. And we all just talked about them tonight. There are a lot of areas where our needs are different, and we need someone who can listen, listen to all the people here, uh, and then go up and convey that up to St. Paul. Uh, and, and of course, turn around and, and make sure that people in this district understand what the, what's happening in St. Paul. But uh, I think uh, pretty much everyone at this table tonight is someone who will be strong and, and willing to do that. Uh, and I certainly feel uh, that I'm able to go up and, and make sure that our needs are represented. If they differ from, uh, the, for example, from my party, then that's just the way it's going to have to be. Uh, this is not certainly something I'm looking at as a, a big career for me forever. Uh, and so I just want to go up there and, and get, what, get some things done. Uh, and, and if that means ruffling some feathers, then so be it. Thank you. According to our agenda, we were to stop our questions at 8 o'clock. If the audience and if the panel of candidates is willing to take one more question, we are willing to do that. Sure. sure. Go right ahead. One more question. Thank you. In what ways would you consider, I'm sorry, I should say who we're asking, Matt. In what ways would you consider protection of the environment and the creation of jobs when faced with making a legislative decision? Sure. And, and this, is, uh, this is a dichotomy that's been discussed for years. And there's an internal tension uh, to, uh, to our environmental protections and our economic development. At least that's been the history. But I think there's great opportunity for us in Minnesota to, to embrace uh, protecting the environment and also the economic opportunity that it affords. And you look uh, at that renewable energy discussion we had made in Minnesota uh, of creating jobs in a new sector in which Minnesota can be a leader and at the same time we can actually do good for our environment and, and grow jobs at the same time. But I think it's important for us to, to, to go into this conversation seeking a balanced approach and recognizing, as we've talked about all night, that compromise really matters. That you can't necessarily have it all one way or all the other. Uh, uh, a state in which we don't have common sense regulations is going to be a state in which consumer protections are ignored and in our environment could, could suffer. Uh, a state in which we have too many regulations, though, in our economy could suffer. And so I think we want to try to strike that right balance between common sense uh, policy and also promoting economic development. Because I look around the state and, you know, Minnesota has really emerged quite well from our, uh, our economic recession, but there's pockets of struggle throughout greater Minnesota. And I think we have to continue to focus on how we level the playing field for greater Minnesota, for those homes and businesses and families that have been left behind in our economic recovery. And so I think it's important for us to promote issues like job uh, training, workforce housing, smart regulation, uh, infrastructure, not only roads and bridges, but broadband, the sorts of things that contribute to a competitive rural economy. And I think it's important to always keep in mind the fact that there's a balance between protecting our environment and promoting economic development. Thank you. Barb. Uh, I have some similar thoughts. I think it is a, a balanced approach, and it's oftentimes looking at the unintended consequences of either regulation you know, or, or legislation, and it requires us to really peel back the onion on all these issues. Uh, we are a state with great natural resources, and I think we, we pride ourselves on protecting those natural resources and seeing those um, as an economic advantage. So those things really do fit together. 
I think Red Wing is a perfect example of that. We look at our natural resources as a way to bring people to our community to uh, enjoy them and spend money and, and stay overnight and eat in our restaurants, right? So those things often go together. I think what we need to guard against is uh, too much regulation that hampers our competitiveness. Uh, Minnesota has become the state that has one of the highest costs of doing business in, in a, any state in the country. And that cost of doing business is our high tax structure, it's also our, our, our tendency to over-regulate, and also just some of our costs of doing business like our cost of electricity or our costs of, of oil, et cetera. So that's a piece, again, in that balance that we need to look at. We want to be competitive, we want businesses to come here, we want to create jobs and we want this economy to thrive, and in doing so, protecting one of our greatest economic development assets, which is our environment. Thank you. Lisa. Well, I think the right way to look at this is, is not to look at these as two competing interests necessarily. They can be, of course, but I think if we can look at it as uh, the more we can protect our environment uh, appropriately in a cost-effective way uh, and with as little regulation as possible, uh, that actually we end up creating jobs. We end up uh, having a stronger economy, and in many uh, in individual uh, economies and, and businesses, we can end up creating more opportunity. And so I think we have to always be looking, as Matt has said, for that sweet spot of um, looking at environmental protection, but as few regulations as possible, and re recognizing that that is actually going to be an economic driver. Um, I think there are many many examples, and I, I would think even in the, the farming industry where looking at economic uh, or environmental protection will ultimately end up in a, a stronger farming economy and, and agriculture. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I think the environment and jobs go together. Uh, there's al always opportunity with our vast resources out in our environment that we have that can create jobs. We see it now. Uh, we have that nuclear power plant out there. Over 700 people work out there. Good paying jobs are out there. And we need to keep, and we need to keep a footprint like that that's nice and small that will not take up a whole lot of our natural resource area and, and main, make it so that we are good, good uh, friends to the nature and, and the environment, and they can't go hand in hand. As everybody has said, uh, we need to have a balanced approach. We need to make sure that we don't have too much regulation out there, and we can come together with common sense solutions if we all get engaged in the conversation and bring our ideas. And, and from there, we, we make our decisions and we move forward with it. But I think we can have a good, solid economic environment for good jobs while protecting our environment. Thank you. We now will have our closing comments by the candidates, and we will do them in the reverse order of when we began. So we will begin with you, Matt. All right. Well, well folks, I, I got into this, uh, this gig as your state senator for one reason. I wanted to serve uh, the area I grew up in and make a, a lasting contribution to Minnesota. And it's been the, the honor of a lifetime to be able to, uh, to not only reconnect with uh, an area that I grew up in, uh, to work so close with my family and friends on knocking on those 30,000 doors, uh, but to do it the right way by running an honest campaign, by focusing on the issues that matter most, uh, by keeping it positive, and talking about what we've done and what we want to do. And so in the last four years, we've balanced our budget for the first time in a decade, folks. We've moved on from a period of a couple of state government shutdowns to an incredibly productive 2013 and 2014 session. And we've been able to invest in education in a way that Minnesota never has before. And not only throwing money at problems, but investing in community partnerships. Every hand joined has been cited tonight. We've been able to set our priorities straight. And we're moving forward with rural broadband expansion, with job training, with workforce housing, the sorts of things that make greater Minnesota competitive. And now in 2017, my number one priority, make health care more affordable and more accessible for folks throughout the state. There's a whole host of things that we can do. We've already started the conversation. And I'm looking forward to putting my passion in the focus that I've applied to broadband and several other issues to work on this one transportation, economic development. There's a whole host of issues that we can do if we work together. And I'm looking forward to being your representative, your state senator, for the next four years. So thank you for the opportunity to participate in what I think has been a very civil conversation. And uh, we got a late start, but I think we more than made up with it with a, a great dialogue. And so thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Mike. Well, thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to be here tonight. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm a concerned citizen. I was brought up to get involved in things. When you see something that's not right, fix it. 
get involved. Uh, that's how mom and dad raised us. Um, I believe in citizen legislators. We go do the work of the people up at the, at the Capitol and then we go back to our, our jobs. It's not, a, it's not a career. It's just a temporary assignment that we go do to make our communities the best we can possibly make it to live in and have people that want to be here, want to raise their kids here. Their kids want to stay here after they go to college or trade school or whatever and come back and work here. Uh, that's why I'm getting involved. Um, the other thing is, uh, as we discussed, we need to have common sense solutions. Unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of that uh, up there. We had a $2 billion tax increase uh, that also at the time included a warehouse tax that put Red Wing Shoes Warehouse on, the, on hold, it killed jobs, and we also had in that tax bill a farm equipment repair tax that it took a whole year to repeal those two taxes. But the damage was done. Our farmers had to pay those taxes. It was not retroactive. And we need to have common sense solutions. That's not common sense. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. For the last eight years, I've been working here, right here at this table, um, on the nonpartisan city council. It's been an amazing experience, and I've learned a great deal. And one of the things I've learned is the, uh, the value of working together and vigorously discussing issues and coming up with uh, solutions without blaming each other and without pointing fingers. We've been able to balance budgets. We got through a terribly difficult economic downturn, and we've done a, a huge amount of strategic planning for the city. And I think you you can look around the city on Highway 61, for example, and see the benefit and, and the position that, that Red Wing is in today. We still have a lot of work to do. I won't pretend to say that we don't, but, uh, but that has been an amazing experience, and I want to bring that experience and the skills I've learned up to St. Paul. I also have developed my own small, successful business, and the experience I have doing that uh, and working all over the city and the district uh, as an attorney, uh, working on behalf of the elderly, uh, of Poor people who can't afford their attorney, I often get court, uh, court assigned, um, has been really a valuable experience. I've seen the mental health issues that we have, the issues our courts have, and our public safety issues uh, with our police. Those are all things that I want to go and be an advocate for, for our district, the needs of our district up in St. Paul. Uh, I believe I have that experience and the skills and the energy. Uh, I like to work with people from all backgrounds and try to accomplish things in a cooperative manner. If we can't do that, then I'm willing to, to as I said before, ruffle some feathers uh, and get some things done. So I'm asking for your vote uh, in November and again thank you for coming tonight thank you Barb thank you um, I'll echo everybody's thanks and, and thanks for your patience um, for a little bit longer forum I guess um, we've talked about a wide variety of issues tonight um, but there are some that didn't come up and some that I've heard most often when I've been out talking to voters um, health care uh, health care costs are staggering and families and small businesses can't afford them and we need to find a, a solution. Uh, people feel like they're paying so much more for their premiums and yet not getting anything for it. Um, we also didn't talk a lot about uh, job growth and job creation and economic development and that really is an issue that I'm passionate about. That sort of starts everything in our towns, right? If we're not economically strong, we don't have jobs here, then people can't move here and put their kids in our schools and keep our community vibrant. So there's a, there's a lot more things that need to be done on that issue. Um, we also haven't talked about, again, this is what I'm hearing from voters. They want government to work for them or they want it to get out of the way. They're very concerned about wasteful spending in St. Paul. The voters have told me they want their government to be efficient and to use their money wisely because it is their money, right? Um, so I think there's more work to be done in each of those areas and I believe that my experience as a business person and the experience I've had working in healthcare and in education and in workforce gives me a unique set of, of skills and knowledge that I bring to the table to serve this district well in St. Paul. I am not a politician, I'm an outsider to the process, but I'm no stranger to leadership. I have proven to this community that I will dig deep and work hard and I will get things done, whether that's improving the health care system here, improving the educational system, or bringing manufacturers and the high schools and the technical colleges together to address workforce. So you can, you can count on me to get the job done. And if that's the type of representative you want and that's the type of government you want in St. Paul, I urge you to vote for Barb. Thank you. Thank you to all of our candidates. Barb Haley, Lisa Bailey, Mike Goggin, and Matt Schmidt. 
and thank you, audience, for your patience and your participation. And I would like us to give a round of applause to the candidates. <laughs> part of tonight's, uh, of tonight's candidate forum. At the conclusion of this meeting, there will be some campaign materials available in the lobby. Also, there is a ballot issue that not a lot of people seem to know about, and it concerns a constitutional amendment whereby uh, a citizens committee could determine legislator pay. Uh, in other words, remove lawmakers' power to set their own pay. And we have some information about that on our poster board there from the League of Women Voters Red Wing. We also have two uh, further forums for the school board candidates. We have a forum on September 28th and for the city council candidates on October 6th, same time, same place, uh, 6.30 p.m. till 8.30. Please consider this your call to action and vote on election day. If you have not registered yet, uh, we have people standing by. So you may register right here this evening out in the lobby. On November 8th, the polls will be open from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. And early voting opens on September 23rd and ends November 7th. We also invite you to learn more about the League of Women Voters Red Wing and to consider joining. We have information available in the lobby and we also have a Facebook page for League of Women Voters Red Wing. We thank you very much for coming tonight. Drive safely and good night. Hey,